just kind of like nervous because I've talked to so many people here and there seems to be way more machine learning experts on the audience than, than us. So like we, we know compared to Lito and I'm going to talk about pretty trivial stuff. But you know, if you have really, we're going to have lots of discussion later. If you have any good questions, please save them in the end. And I'm sure like we can learn more from you than the other way around. So uh, I'm going to talk about today like uh, the theme of machine learning and how to apply it to make creative tools for artists and designers. Sure. Okay. So let, let's introduce ourselves. We we work in Google Brain. You know, Google pays our salaries. It's, it's a pretty cool place. Uh, and they we focus on machine learning research. And they also de develop TensorFlow. You know, the the most popular open source framework for deep learning. But there's more competitors these days, as I know. Uh, the research areas of Google Brain include you know, natural language understanding, like machine translation, uh, healthcare, computer vision, like perception, machine learning theory. Like we, we kind of want to know what's actually going on, uh, robotics, and and what we're doing. We're focused on music, art, and tools in a project called Magenta. So Magenta is a is a team within Google Brain. Uh, we focus on music and art with machine learning. And it started off focusing on music, you know, creating tools to model initially like uh, just MIDI files and piano music. But uh, as we're going to see from Adam later, it's grown to many very beautiful and, and sophisticated projects, which I'm quite proud of uh, seeing. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of recent work that we published this year. And I think later on uh, next week at NIPS, there's going to be the, the more presentations that's going to follow. Uh, so inside Google Brain, uh, there's also, even outside of Magenta, there's been a lot of work that is related to to machine learning that can be applied to creativity. Like for example, colorization is is an interesting topic that I find. Like uh, in colorization, the problem here is to take black and white images and to predict what colors the image would be if it were a color image. So this may seem like an easy problem because like, we can get infinite training data. We can take any image and convert them, an RGB image, to black and white. But it's actually harder than it looks. Like, for example, like a, for, for, like a, for a, a helmet, for football helmets, like, we don't know exactly what color it should be in. But maybe there's a pos range of possible colors that we can assign. So some of our work includes this, this work on PIX color. That, that chooses a set of different modes to choose from. Uh, so I think this, this is an interesting uh, research direction inside Google Brain. So inside uh, Google Brain, there's another research topic that uh, our group did as well called a neural style transfer research. And I'm sure we've all played with neural style transfer. There's lots of apps that can transfer styles to famous artists. But here, the work is uh, we, we take a style, and we actually try to model a latent space of a style. What this means is you know, we can take an image of Brad Pitt and find the style of Brad Pitt so that we can find, uh, if we apply style transfer, you get the same image. And if we are able to do that, we can interpolate between this different style. We can interpolate a floating point vector to go from Brad Pitt and choose how much of this artistic style we want. And this theme of being able to, to interpret, uh, interpolate between a latent vector uh, we find to be to be quite profound and important for a lot of uh, creative ML tools that we're going to talk about later. So, and you know, as we heard, there there's a lot of work at GANs. Uh, Ian Goodfellow, uh, who who invented GANs, work at Google Brain, and you know, there's so many GANs there that I can't even keep track of. Like, I think there's only like 700 possible GAN names with XX GAN. So uh, I I can't keep up with the research anymore, but. But like the, the idea is like we're, you, you can also take, take a, a vector, like a Gaussian randomly generated vector, take two of them, and interpolate between two different rendered images to get an interpolation between spaces. And in some of these GAN models, you can also encode images. So on, on the left-hand side, we can see we can take an actual real face and encode it to a GAN version. And then we can take another face and encode it to another GAN uh, floating point vector and then interpolate them. So like uh, this, this uh, interpolation theme that we're seeing more and more of inside of machine learning. So in, in my own work, uh, in this work, we try to create a generative model for vector images. Because you know, as a new researcher, it's, it's kind of 
hard to compete against GANs. So you want to try to find something where there's not a lot of people working on. And also, since like, everyone's working on modeling pixel images, we want to try modeling vector images. In this work called SketchRNN, we, we develop a model that can generate vector images. And you can see here we generate images of cats, you know, peep stick figures, I think, uh, trucks and insects. And we're also able to interpolate between these images using uh, this method. So this work that we did was in, it's inspired by, by artists. Like this is my favorite piece from, piece from Picasso. And Picasso spent his life trying to understand representation. He would probably make a good computer vision researcher, you know. If, but the good thing is, you know, instead he spent his life making beautiful art pieces rather than writing nibs papers. <laughs> and uh, we see on the on the left hand side he starts to draw very realistic pictures of ox. Uh, you know, a lot of machine learning techniques now is about modeling realistic images. But what we're more interested in is modeling doodles of ox on the right-hand side. So I think you know, these doodles are special because you know, just with a few strokes, we as humans understand that this doodle is an ox. And I think if we're able to, to model how people draw doodles, it might tell us a thing or two about how we ourselves uh, interpret what we see in our mental image of the world. So that's one of the motivations for this research. And you know, uh, so the data set that we're going to work with is a data set that looks like these vector images. Uh, this turtle is something that I drew. It's not as good as Picasso, but it'll do the job. Uh, and we're going to model pictures as a sequence of motor actions of a pen, like their, their relative x and y coordinates and also the state of the pen. And we're not going to model like a traditionally pixel images. So our, our image model will have to generate uh, these sequences to, to mimic these these vector images. And you know, it's, it's relatively easy to get data sets of pixel images, especially of celebrities or random things. But it's, it's relatively hard to get big data sets of vector images. So luckily, we were, you know, inside Google, there's this game called QuickDraw, launched at the end of last year, which went viral. And uh, thanks to our friends you know, at Creative Lab, they've been able to collect millions of these doodles. And in this game, oh, by the way, if, if you play this game, I want to thank you for contributing <laughs> to our data set as well. So in this game, uh, it's, it's kind of fun. Uh, it's kind of gimmicky. So the game tells the user to draw something, like a bear. And in under 20 seconds, the user has to draw a bear. And you know, uh, there's a neural network that has nothing to do with our research to, to tell the user whether it thinks it's a bear or not. But regardless, we get the data, and we've open sourced all of the data. And inside of GitHub, there's around 50 million images of these vector images that we can play with. So we train our model on the, the quick draw data set of vector images. So I'll talk a, briefly about our model. Our model, you know, called SketchRNN, is a, variation, is a variational autoencoder combined with recurrent neural network. Recurrent neural networks because we're dealing with sequences. So when we want to train this model, what we can do is like take a training image of this cat here and encode the sequence of motor actions that's required to draw this cat into an encoder RNN. This RNN would output a latent vector, like a vector of floating point numbers, into a low dimensional vector z. And then uh, we will add noise to this latent vector, like a typical Gaussian noise in a variational autoencoder, to, to make it generalize and so that it can't store infinite information. And we're at, when we're actually generating a sketch, uh, we use a decoder RNN, our, an autoregressive recurrent neural network, to sample each of these motor actions to generate the cats. And we're going to condition the decoder on this latent vector so that it would generate a cat that may mimic the information that's encoded into the training sample. And when we train this, we want to minimize the distance between the output image and the input image. And this can be trained end to end. So uh, after we built this uh, model, we can, we can test it on some examples. Uh, here's a model trained on only the cats. So there's, there's no labels. We just took only the cat class in the data set and trained it. And we, we can see some examples where if we feed in like a cat with a body and a cat with a head, it generally draws a similar looking cat. Uh, but here, like if we feed in like a cat with uh, three eyes, for <laughs> example, like it'll only draw a cat with two eyes. So it kind of learned a thing or two about like, what a cat should look like. But we just to stress test it, and you know we don't want it to 
keep an internal lookup table of the most common cats uh, and display that. We, w we can feed in like a, a toothbrush and, and then it'll feed out something that kind of looks like the toothbrush but has cat-like characteristics. So it, it learns to, to draw like what the human on a quick draw data set will draw as the essence of the cat, which I, I thought was interesting. You can repeat this uh, experiment with pigs as well. And we see here it, it can learn to correct the number of legs of the pig. And if we feed in a truck, it will still draw a pig, but it'll, it'll kind of look like the truck. And, and it, uh, we, we can, because this model is, we can convert the data into a latent space. If we train a model on all of the cats and all of the pigs at the same time, we can even do things like interpolate between cats and pigs. So here we, we first auto encode the cat head into a cat and a pig with a body into a pig. So they, they're not exactly the same. But you know, if we play around with GANs or our variational autoencoders, you can see when we can morph between one photo to another photo. Here's an example where we, we can morph between a vector image to another vector image. So we can see like stroke by stroke how, how it changes as we, as we interpolate between this latent vector. And we see like uh, the latent vector captures things like you know the body and whether the, the face is a cat or a pig, and you know unlike unlike pixel images that's more or less smooth. We see more uh, discontinuities when we interpret this because we're encoding something that's a continuous value, but the decoder is actually half continuous because the pen states you, know, you whether you lift up the pen or not and whether you finish the drawing or not is is discrete. So we we see more gappy. Uh, latent spaces because of that. Here we, we can also interpolate between trucks or, or buses and cats. You get cat bus and, and you know, like the, the pig and the elephants. You know. This is South Park anyways, right? And uh, for those of you familiar with uh, word to vec, we can do like sketch to vec and we can, we can take away the body of a pig and add a body to a cat by doing vector arithmetic. So in, it would be interesting, like uh, we, we tried to train this model on all of the yoga drawings. Uh, yo yoga drawings, people generally draw stick figures. So they, these are quite easy to model. But uh, when we sample, uh, we don't just take the argmax, but we, we can control a temperature parameter so that we can control how certain uh, our distribution is or how uncertain it is. And as we, if we make the temperature really low, we get the average yoga pose that people tend to draw in, in a vector drawing. And if we increase the temperature, we get like these hot yoga, kind of like very chaotic yoga positions with mats. And if we take a few random points in latent space of Z, we can interpolate them and even make an animation. So I like, I like these latent space animations because it kind of tells us the limitations of our model and where it can go wrong. Like sometimes it generates a bag of lines, but sometimes the mat becomes the legs <laughs> and, and so on. So this app, uh, there's some creative applications one can use with such a model. Like given, given some start of an image, we can draw various different gardens, faces, owls, uh, mosquitoes, and, and trucks, and so on. So it, it's like a auto-complete for drawings, which you know, to be honest, there, there's, I think there's more we can do there. Like I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of auto-complete. Maybe we can ignore what it's suggesting and figure out something we want to draw. Here's an example where you can draw like a, a cloud and it'll, it'll draw the rain afterwards by training on the, on the rain class. Uh, one of my colleagues, Ian Johnson, he, he combined this model with an open source program that generates realistic paint and he's generating these like uh, faces using this JavaScript program. So these faces are generated using SketchR and then and another, another gentleman, Alexis, uh, he combines SketchRNN with, uh, with this edge detector. So if you take a webcam, you point it into the sky, you get clouds and you draw this little line around the cloud, you can, you can fill in the initial stroke into SketchRNN to draw, to generate the cats in the cloud. So I thought that was kind of cool. So we also play with building mock-up apps uh, using this tool so that you know, on the left-hand side, we can draw the beginning of a bug and It'll, it'll finish variations of the bug, and maybe that may provide some inspiration or not. But I think, I think these mock-up tools are useful if we want to play around with how we should use our machine learning tools. 
So I mean, these don't take that long to build, but I, I really like the concept of moving machine learning tools into interactive JavaScript so that we can play around with it. Because you know, if, if you just run a model and you can't play around with it, it's, it's hard to have an intuition of the limitations of the model, and it's hard to be creative to see what you can actually build in these models. So I think like, these, the ability to move TensorFlow or PyTorch models into JavaScript is, or whatever fast UI framework is, is quite important for the future. Uh, someone from uh, an art school in New York University took our, Allison, took our program, took a model trained on everything, and started generating these abstract pieces, which look kind of funky. So maybe, maybe Allison can sell this at some point. And you know, inside Quick Draw, there, there's hundreds of classes. Uh, we try to build models that train on more than one class as well. And if you, you know, every, uh, there's a lot of experts here. If you want to play around with a quick straw data set, I also recommend taking similar classes that are, have similar characteristics. For example, cats, lions, and tigers. Because I found on a, on a cat class, usually you just get heads and you don't get many bodies. But that's opposite from the tiger class. So by taking the different classes, you can, you can get more from training on a quick draw data set. So that's, that's just something I found. Uh, you know, subsequent work, some, uh, because we, we put this paper out earlier this year, there's other research groups around the world who uh, played around with the model as well. So this work from Chen's group, uh, uh, they took the model, but rather than doing a sequence to sequence model, they use a convolutional network as the encoder. So you can actually feed in a pixelated version of a sketch. And they found this work better. Uh, if, if you use a pixel encoder into a convnet, into your latent space, you can do things like, like put in Bugs Bunny, Mashimaro, and so on. And then you can, you can feed that to generate your latent vector. And from that latent vector, generate the nearest or what, what the, the quick draw data domain would look like. So the, these look kind of convincing. I'm not sure if these are cherry pick, but uh, who knows. But like, for example, like the, the Hello Kitty, the, they kind of, kind of appear in the same places with different characteristics and the Bugs Bunny. So I, I like the, the fact that we, we put this code out and the paper out and people can take it and, and extend it and make things better. So here's some prior work I've done before joining uh, Google Brain. So when I tried to learn TensorFlow and RNNs, you know, we, we, I, I was reading tutorials where you can train RNNs to generate text and so on, but I, I trained an, a recurrent neural network to generate kanji or Chinese characters uh, by studying some free fonts that were available so that it can hallucinate uh, kanjis that don't exist, like you know, urban sheep, huh. you know, stick stone ladies, and so on. <laughs> uh, so th this, this work was sort of inspiration from that, that time. But because now we built a variational autoencoder, we can also now uh, use this model to train again on the kanji and look at the interpolation between different kanji, which was not possible when I first started. But here, if, you, if you're familiar with, with kanji, there's like the the, the simplified way of writing turtle and also the book. And then it can interpolate between how to write these characters. And when it's writing them, it's writing them in a, in a, in a stroke order. That still kind of makes sense. It's the essence of how people write you know, from top to bottom, left to right, and so on. The, they, we don't really know. This, this character does not exist. So <laughs> there's no correct stroke order for that. But the stroke order for the, the top left and the bottom right is correct. So it, it'll still write the stroke order of the middle characters, imaginary characters, in a self-consistent way. So I mean, if, if you train a GAN or a VAE on the pixel versions of these characters, it doesn't have the sequential information. But the good thing about this model is we capture the sequential information, and the latent code would store a plausible way from the data on how to write this. So I think you know, it, it's kind of good to stress test our models that it works not just for quick draw, but maybe it works for, for kanji as well. And the, the good thing about uh, the open source community is you know, we put our models out there. This is, I implemented Alex Graves' handwriting model, and I put out the TensorFlow model. And people do interesting things with these models after you put it on GitHub. Like someone, someone took our model and, and combined it with an axi draw and started generating gibberish. And they call it like a ghostwriter uh, axi draw with a handwriting RNN. And someone else also took the sketch RNN model and combined it with this low-cost mural bots. 
I think it costs less than 100 bucks. And then you, you can generate drawings on the fly and have the robot dry on, on a piece of paper. So I thought that was, that was kind of cool. And so we, we also put all of the, the code as an open source uh, TensorFlow code in, in the tensorflow.org domain. But if you're a Py PyTorch user, there's also a PyTorch implementation as well. So that's it from me. And then uh, I'm going to leave the presentation to my colleague, Adam, who's going to talk about his work on music generation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. And thank you for having us. Um, let me just switch over. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm also work on uh, the Magenta uh, project along with David um, on, at Google Brain. I uh, just want to give a little bit more background about Magenta specifically. So we're, our goal is pretty, pretty large. We're trying to figure out, um, we're, we're trying to do you know, fundamental machine learning research as well as apply that research to the domain of creativity, um, create actual interfaces that music musicians and artists can actually use, and then kind of get feedback from them and, and iterate from there. So we have, we, have, um, we have a pretty large goal for ourselves, um, but we think that you kind of have to do all of those pieces to actually make this work. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest pieces, though, is actually really interfacing with the, the external community of developers as well as artists. So we have, you know, all of our code goes up on our GitHub whenever it's ready, and you know, we publish everything we can, and we, we, you know, I get emails from artists all the time that we bring in and try to explain machine learning to them, usually unsuccessfully, but um, hopefully, eventually, all, all of our stuff will be easy enough to use that you won't need to know how to, you know, run TensorFlow to do it. Um, so, like, one of we like to give this example of. of <laughs> We like to give this example of uh, like Les Paul and Jimi Hendrix, and we kind of liken ourselves more on the Les Paul side of you know we're although you know he himself was actually a pretty incredible um, practitioner. Like we, you know we're we're kind of developing these tools, and we don't actually know um, how the artist is ultimately going to use them. And so, like one of our biggest, most rewarding things that could happen, we feel, is if somebody took um, something we built for one purpose and just kind of like used it for some totally wacky way that was actually really amazing and, and you know, changed rock music like Jimi Hendrix did with feedback. Um, you know, the, the original goal for the electric guitar was not for that. It was for just being able to hear the guitar in a large room. Uh, so if you're, if you're going to look at music um, with machine learning in, in the modern age, uh, I think the, the first thought is to use something like an LSTM, so recurrent neural network, doing next step prediction. Um, you know, this has been done a lot with, with text, you know, predicting the next character based on the previous ones. Uh, so you can apply the same idea to notes, where, you know, given the notes that it's output previously, what, what should it output next? Um, and, you know, one simple way of doing this to model like a monophon monophonic melody uh, is just to output, you know, each time step some pitch to start a new note, or maybe you should just hold the previous note you were playing, or maybe you should stop playing any, anything and rest for this next, this next step. And you could like quantize your, your music down to like 16th notes or something, right? So that's, that's where we started. And you know, after finding some, you know, scraping the web for every single MIDI file in existence, um, and then cherry picking our favorite output, we came up with this. Let's we'll see if this works. And then all the record labels called us and were like, you know. <laughs> so, so you get, like, it's very, very like elementary, but it, it, it kind of gets the essence of like what a melody sounds like. And, and it's actually really fun to play with, uh, you know, just having it generate random things or inputting some sequence and then letting it try to continue it. And we built, I'm not going to show all of them, but we built several tools that allow people to kind of play around with that concept. Um, but one thing you might notice immediately is just, oops. I always do this every single time. Okay, is is kind of how robotic it, it sounds, right? And that's because of, for a couple of reasons. One is the quantization. So I mentioned like we're quantizing the sixteenth notes. Also, we're only because we only want to have a single um, output, like a categorical variable in the end, where we're just saying play this note or hold or rest. We can't specify play this note, but play it. You know, push the key this hard, or you know, only 
uh, play it like a slightly before the beat or something like that. So it, I want to show you an example just like of a nice musical piece that's been destroyed in this similar way. So if you take um, a good piece of music and you quantize it, this is kind of what it sounds like. And I apologize, I don't, I don't know what this is actually. I should probably. Okay, so this is that same piece played by um, Sagiv Orr, who's a member of our team. So this is not an AI playing it, but. <laughs> See, I, I want to listen to that one a lot longer um, because it has that like humanity, that, that real feel of emotion to it that, that the other one lacks. Um, so kind of the first, that was like the first battle we wanted to fight is like how can we kind of get that back. Um, and so Ian Simon and Sagiv on our team came up with, uh, you know, it's just, it seems like so simple now, but like a different way of representing the output space where now um, at each time step, uh, sorry, at each output step, you're actually not outputting for, for a specific um, 16th note. You can actually output, you know, whether you want to turn some note on or, or, you know, you can think of it as pushing the key down on the piano. Um, whether you want to lift your finger off the key, and also how you, you can also change how hard you're pushing the keys for the next time, right? So but one output step, it might say, next time you play a key, you play it this hard, and then you know, it'll tell you which key to play. Uh, and then you might also want to advance the clock forward. So now you can get really fine-grained timing information of just a few milliseconds ahead, um, and you can play, do polyphony, right? You can push down multiple notes and then move time forward. Um, and you, so let's see. Oh, actually, sorry. One more thing, though, you need with that is you actually need a different data set because the data that we scraped off the web, all, web, all these MIDI files, most of them are just made by somebody like sitting down with a sequencer and taking their favorite like pop song and put, making a, a karaoke version, right? And so it's already qu it's quantized. They probably didn't do velocities. It doesn't have. It's not played by a person. Um, actually, performed by a person. But Yamaha was nice enough to. Um, they probably had didn't know this. We were gonna anybody was gonna do this type of thing with it, but they. They just took all these performances of people using their Disclavier piano, which is this really amazing, um, it's a really nice piano, but it also records MIDI with, you know, really precise, and can play back MIDI too, which is really fun. Um, and they just put a bunch of performances up online in terms of MIDI, in MIDI format, and so we were able to train on that. And then what you get is something, whenever we now generate from the model that was trained on this data, you get something like this. Uh, that's that's not what I wanted to sound like. I don't know what's going on there. Let's try this other one because that one kind of started off bad. So I think you can see there's a lot, you know, I, I don't need to explain the difference there, right? As far as like that versus the original thing I played you, I think there's a huge, uh, huge amount of progress. One thing that you might notice though is it, it definitely lacks, the, the original one I played had a little bit more like repetitiveness. It sounded a little bit more like a song, whereas this just sounds like somebody going off on the piano. Um, and and that has to do with the fact that now your, your um, outputs are way more dense, right? Like for a given second of music, you have to do a bunch of different outputs to change the velocity, you know, st start a bunch of notes, then, then move to the next time step. Whereas before, um, you know, it was just 16th notes. So you could, the model could kind of remember a little bit more of what it was doing and was able to then learn how to repeat and things like that. So this kind of lacks, um, any, lacks the structure that the original model had. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so these are, these, are, these are cool, but they, Right now, I've, so far, I've just shown you something where you can like basically push a button and get something out. We really are, our goal is really to provide uh, some tool for musicians to use. Um, so the, the big question we ask ourselves is like, how can we actually build a model that musicians can control? And you know, we don't actually don't want it to be that quite that complicated. Uh, we want it to be something like this, like just really intuitive, um, but but that anybody can actually combine. You know, they 
musicians are able to take these individually, they're kind of simple, and then combine them in com complex ways to make a really unique sound. Uh, and that's, that's what we'd like to be able to um, enable them to do with our stuff. Um, so with this, with this model I showed you a minute ago, the performance RNN, um, you know, we thought like, okay, well how can we add some more controls to it? And we came up with you know, a really simple, the most obvious way you would do it is to add some conditioning into the model um, so that when you're training it, you're also measuring things like, um, for this piece of music that I'm tra training on, how dense, it, how dense are the, um, sorry, was it pitch density? I think that's more note density. So how dense are the notes? How many notes are being played every second? And you can kind of feed that information into the model. And so then at generation time, you can specify, I want you to give me something that's this dense, and that'll kind of bias it towards producing things like it saw whenever you were telling it before that that's what it was seeing. So this, we built this little interface um, that you, some of you may have seen uh, using Deep Learn JS, by the way, which is, an which is a really nice uh, web framework that actually does all the inference in your browser. So now, so this thing is just generating on its own from this model, but I can do things like, you know, turn up the note density. And you see that it's starting to play a little faster. I can change, you know, which, which key it's playing in based on this pitch histogram. Let me turn this down a little bit. So now it should only play mostly black keys, which it's doing. Right, so this is a little bit of control. So that's kind of fun. Um, but it's still, one of the problems with this type of conditioning is that you have to, when you're training the model, you have to like basically decide, okay, these are the things I want people to be able to control and then train the model with that in mind. Um, whereas uh, it, when you're using a latent space model, like what um, David was showing before with the sketch model, uh, you actually have some more freedom to to define that stuff later on, which I'm which I'm going to talk a little bit about now. How we made that possible. Um, so an autoencoder like SketchRNN is this thing where you're training it. It's it's basically it's sort of two models, right? We have an encoder and a decoder where you give it your inputs, you pass you pass it through the encoder, which produces some some small code. So it's it's much smaller than your original input. So you're forcing it through a bottleneck. It has to learn how to compress the data down somehow. Then you pass it through a decoder, which upsamples it essentially back to, the, the goal at least is to get it back to the original input as its output. And so you train this end to end, and you, know, you penalize it whenever, it's, whenever it does it incorrectly, and, and you know, just like how you, you'd use gradient descent to, to train this. Um, and then when you, in the end, you get this, this z vector, which essentially is like a point in this huge latent space that uh, um, represents a given example, uh, and the points that you that don't align to something that you input also should be something that that is in the same distribution as what you train the model on. So one of the other things I didn't mention is this is a variational auto autoencoder, meaning that we actually also regular regularize it so that the points we try to keep the points all within um, something similar to a normal distribution, or, you know, a multivariate normal distribution. So you can think about it as trying to compress all this data down into points that lie within this huge sphere or something. And um, any, any point in that space, when you decode it, should produce something like your data that you trained it on. And this will become a little bit more clear later on. But the, the idea is that you, w you, when you play in this space, instead of trying to adjust things in your input or output space, you're actually able to um, control variables that the model has learned are important. Uh, and, and, and as you saw, like whenever, um, whenever David was showing you with the interpolations, you imagine going from the cat to the pig, there's some dimension of this high dimensional space that whenever you move along it, it's making things more pig-like or more cat-like. The model has kind of learned what that means, even though we, don't we can't necessarily define it ourselves. And the goal is to learn something similar for music. So again, the sketch RNN work was definitely an inspiration um, for the work that I did this last year, which was um, music VAE. So this is uh, a variational autoencoder that instead of being trained on sketches, is trained on sequences of notes. Um, so the first thing I want to show you is, is doing interpolation with that. And again, if you can imagine this, this space of all of our points, and if I give it two uh, examples and have it map it into that space with the encoder, then I can move slowly along the, 
the points that connect those two points and, and have it um, decode and output a, a, a musical sequence. In this case, I've trained it on just short two bar uh, drum beats and also on little melodies. So this, this does have the quantization I, I showed I had before, so you have to forget all that great stuff I said about adding humanity to it. We lost the humanity again, but it, we, ha we have this additional control. So let's first listen to this drum beat interpolation. What you're going to hear first is the two bars at the beginning, then you'll hear the two bars at the end, and then you'll hear the slow interpolation between them. That's the first one. This is where we're going. So one, one thing to note is that this, you'll, you'll hear it a little bit better in the second one, but in this example, it's actually not just, it's not just adding in individual notes. You can see that there's actually some that it remove, it adds some things in and removes them because what it's doing is actually trying to produce something that's reasonable um, under the distribution and um, just adding in individual notes isn't always going to be, the, be, be something that would, the model thinks is reasonable. So now let's listen, and unfortunately the sound's not so great, but let me try to turn this up. Let's listen to an a, a interpolation for melodies. I think you'll definitely notice that a little bit more here. So that's where we're starting. So they're quite different, but let's see if you can hear any large shifts. Back it up just a little bit. So unfortunately, I was kind of, oh. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't come across perfectly on the, uh, uh, over the Apple TV, but the, uh, I think you can see from this image that it's pretty smooth, right? Like you didn't hear any point where it just like totally shifted to something different. Um, and so I think this is kind of a cool tool where, uh, you know, some, I, I can imagine, for example, a DJ, you know, entering in like their sequences they want to start their, their, their song with and like, here's where I want to go. And then now they have the freedom to play around with, you know, all the effects and stuff on it as, it, as it's kind of slowly shifting there. Um, and in fact, we kind of have built, or working on, this is our early prototype, um, some interfaces that will allow you to do this uh, using, again, DeepLearn.js in, in, in your browser. So let's look at this quickly. So this is using the drum beats where I can drag this. So in the co four corners, I just have four drum beats that were, you know, these are kind of hard-coded in for now. Um, and then as I move this around, you can see how it's interpolating in the space between them. So we can turn it on. Uh, 
Um, and then I can also, you know, I can generate random corners. So in this case, it's just going to sample four points from that, that uh, Gaussian distribution. So now we have just new drum beats in each corner. And then we can, you know, mix them again in this, in this 2D space. And then we can also uh, draw a little path. So we can say, I want you to start there and end up there. And so just over time, it's going to slowly morph um, as it moves through this, this, uh, this 2D space. And so again, this is kind of an early version of it. It's also going to be able to work with melodies as well. Um, and we were, again, hoping that people are going to be able to take this and actually use it to um, produce music. So what we're going to have ways for them to actually pipe this through their favorite production software and, and use it to um, compose something, as well as to do a live performance. All right. All right, so then um, I was also wanting to try to do this with, with longer sequences than just two bars. But it turns out, again, as you, as you saw earlier, like when you start getting to really long sequences, the model tends to forget what it was doing before. And it makes it difficult um, in this, in this um, variational autoencoder framework for it to be able to reconstruct something from the input space and the output space if you just use a single LSTM um, going from end to end. So what instead I, I did is I built this, this kind of hierarchical LSTM um, decoder where, the first, where the, you have different clock rates. So the first level, um, for example, if we want to model, here I'm modeling 16 bars. The first level just outputs 16 embeddings from the latent vector. And then each of those are decoded into a single bar of music. So it's like 16 by 16 here, so you get your full 16 bars. Um, but what's really key here is that you're, you're doing each of these bars, you're decoding it completely independently. So that no state is passed from one bar to the next. And it has, that forces the latent vector to model the long-term structure of the music instead of just um, some local rules for it to follow. And, and this gives you a much better um, outcome in terms of you know, getting repetition and getting um, something that doesn't just wander, wander around a theme. And so I want to play you some examples of that. Actually, first I want to mention one other thing you can do which I, I quickly tried was, instead of just sending this, this second, level latent, uh, second level embedding to a single LSTM, you can send it to three separate ones that are each trained on a different instrument and kind of model the dependencies between different instruments in a song. But again, you're not doing it um, in a way that the, the language model at the lowest level can just learn, when this does this, this other thing tends, you know, that when the drums do this, the bass does this. Instead, you're actually forcing that to be encoded inside the embedding. Um, and so here's just kind of a, a sample from, from that model, where I've, I've separated out like a lead, melody, a bass line, and, and the drums. So that's starting to sound a lot more like, like a band. I want to play a few more examples because I actually like, I really, I like just go to bed listening to these sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, here's, here's a couple more examples of this. my favorite. But. a lot more that I would love to play, but we're running out of time. Um, but OK, so, the, so that's, I was really excited to get those types of um, results.
But again, coming back to like the original theme of this, you know, that's just like pushing a button and getting something out. I mean, you would, if you wanted to turn that into a song, a, like a talented musician could take, or a producer could take that and make something cool out of it, I think. Um, so there's still obviously a level of human creativity there. Um, but, but I think what's, what's more interesting is actually be able to control what it's outputting and be able to t teach it maybe. Um, you know, you've, this model has learned kind of this huge space of music. That these are, like, here, here are the things that I like, when, and so give me more of this. And maybe if you, even if you can't define what this is. And this is where this work that um, I did with Jace, Jesse Engel and, and Matt Hoffman at Google recently on link constraints comes in. Although I have to say, Jesse and Matt did most of the theoretical work, and then I, I applied it to this model. Um, and this is on archive. I highly recommend you check out the paper. It's, it's pretty awesome. And I can, again, say that because I only did a, a small part of the work. But um, the idea here is that instead of like interpolating between two points in the space, I'm just going to sample one point. Um, but I'm going to teach a model how to take that point and turn it and, and shift it into some subspace of, of the latent space that I find interesting in some way. And there's a, we, we, we outline a bunch of different ways to actually do this, but you're basically training a GAN that uh, the, the um, discriminator is saying, is this, is this Z, this latent space code, is this in that space that I like? Um, and then your generator is taking a Z, or you know, we call it an actor, but it's, it's taking the Z and shifting it. So it's just trying to shift it to the subspace that you're interested in. The other model's trying to identify whether you've, you've succeeded or not, and they're, kind of, they're actually working together cooperatively to, instead of adversarially to, to figure out how to do this. Um, so an example of what, you, what we did with, with music is taking a, a sample out of this model that I just played, instead, except in this case we're only modeling melodies, um, and train it on a couple of different uh, rules to follow. So I'm, first I'm just going to play uh, the initial prior example. This is just a random sample. I'm not going to play the whole thing just for time. Um, but what, what you can see on the top here is that the red lines are basically showing where the notes are falling um, on the, the, the black keys. So this, they're outside of the C major um, scale. So what we, we did is we trained a model to be able to take a Z, a latent vector, and shift it into a space where it would only play within the C major scale. And so this is how it would shift that prior sample. So you should hear and see that it's very similar, but again, it's, the key's been shifted. Um, and then finally, we can also te teach it how to increase the note density as well. So this is taking that original prior again and shifting it both into C and to a higher note density. So there's nothing special about those rules, except that th those in particular are easy to, to judge, so we're able to train it faster. But your rule could simply be listening to it and saying, oh, I like this one, I don't like this one. I mean, it would take, uh, you know, we'd have to work to get, trying to get the number of examples that you would need to give it down. But it's definitely doable, and it's something that we're, we're working on right now. Uh, let's see what I have left. So I'm not going to, I don't have much time to go into NSynth, um, unfortunately, but it's an autoencoder. Uh, as well, using uh, WaveNet to model audio. If you've heard of WaveNet, it's great work out of DeepMind, and we, we collaborated with them on this project. Um, yeah. I, you know, I have to say I like the dog bone better. Um, so yeah, I'll just play you some examples of this. It's a similar idea. Um, it's much harder to model audio for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but we have this nice interface. You can go to g.co slash soundmaker. Um, and I am going to do the, the dog bone. So um, in this case, I'm going to show you starting with a trombone on one side and a dog barking on the other side. And then down here on the slider, I have it right in the middle. So I'm going to, this is going to be what's right in between those two. <laughs> right, so it's, it's mixing, not, it's not just taking the two waveforms and like averaging them. It's actually mixing these higher level um, these higher level features that it's learned in, this in, in its embedding space, or its latent space. 
and and you know you can you can shift it more towards the trombone side or back towards the dog side um, and get different results. Obviously, like you know, musicians aren't necessarily interested in that example, but you can really do some find some amazing sounds in this by mixing instruments that you you know would never have thought of um, before. And um, so there's this tool that's kind of more of a fun tool to play with, but we've also built an actual like Max for Live device that that which is like the software that people use to actually make music professionally, or a lot of them do, and it plugs right in. Um, and it allows them to kind of explore these really large spaces of, of interpolations between instruments and get some really amazing sounds. So if you want to try that out, um, either one of those you could check out on our, our blog. Um, so what's next? We're doing a lot of work on um, getting more data. So we're finding interesting ways to have people give us data, like musicians who are interested in, in helping out the project, as well as learning, um, figuring out how to take audio and convert it into a symbolic format. And we've had some recent progress uh, on that since successes with um, piano transcription. Um, you know, we're, we're working very closely with a lot of really incredible researchers at, in Google Brain, so we're trying to apply like the newest um, models to, newest architectures to our work, um, and still working on these, these latent constraint models. Uh, and then finally, work, as you saw, the, a few of the examples I showed there were these nice interfaces. We did not make those because we are not, uh, uh, the most of us at least are not great UI people, but there's a lot of great UI designers at Google who are really interested in this, and so we're really happy to collaborate with them. And we're also looking for more people outside of Google um, to, to help as well. And so if, you, if you're interested, check out our um, g.co slash magenta for our blog, our code, all of that. So thank you very much. Super cool. Um, so we're going to open it up to discussion and questions, yeah. um, of which I have one. <laughs> Uh, so both of you guys use this phrase a bunch of times, and I think it's it's really interesting. Uh, and that that phrase is uh, is latent space. Um, so we talked a whole lot about latent spaces here. Um, I personally think that's exactly the right thing we should be talking about. Um, but for maybe other people in the audience who are less familiar with what that means, can you explain kind of one the meaning and the two why why that's come up so often uh, in the work? I think one a good approach about modeling the data distribution as a latent vector is because <clears throat> you know, like a, we map the real world into a low dimensional vector, even for example, a two dimensional vector. And we as people are, are we're, we're, we're e it's easy for people to, to maneuver two dimensional space. Like look at Adam's demo, you can drag around in this screen or even in the, the 3D interface. So I think uh, latent space is a good framework to, to navigate uh, the data distribution. But for, for creativity purposes, I think, you know, when we listen to music, like top 40 or whatever, like most of them sound the same. So like there, we can argue that there is a latent space that models the data distribution that exists or what people like. But at the same time, uh, I feel we should not be totally attached to the idea of a latent space. Because I think if, if we want to generate something that already exists, then we can look inside the latent space. But if we want to find novelty, then we have to look outside the latent space. But I think uh, that being said, having a latent space as a framework allows us to easily navigate what we already know. And because it allows us to navigate what we already know, it also allows us to navigate outside of what we already know. So having this framework is, is useful, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd also add just like one of the really important things about, about how you train these, these uh, like variational autoencoders in, in these latent space models, is that by f you're f forcing it through a bottleneck, like I said, right? If, if you had that, if that was as wide as your input data, it could just pass all the bits through and reproduce the same thing on the other end. But you're forcing it to actually pick out what is important information, like what does it need to keep and what can it get rid of? And by doing that, it's actually learning these, these features of, you know, whatever it is it's modeling. It's learning features of music. It's learning features of sketches um, that then you can control by by like twiddling the knob on those, right? And um, yeah, so I think that's, so it's kind of like, it's, it's a, somewhat of an art to actually train these well because you have to des decide like what is the right capacity? How, how much am I gonna squeeze it to where it, maybe it can't actually reproduce things well, but it's really distilled down like the fundamentals of, of what a two bar loop sounds like so that whenever I pick out a random point, it's going to produce something that sounds like a loop. 
Um, whereas if you let it be too wide, then you can pick out a random point and it just sounds random because it's, it's, it hasn't been forced to distill it down to, a, to that, that, those fundamentals. Cool. Um, in the vein of uh, your, your description of Picasso, Picasso's uh, attempt at deconstructing images and turning them into this like concept through a sketch, and also what you discussed about how um, your aim with the sketch RNN is to understand how we conceptually represent objects. Um, is there a way that you could, and I mean with, with music as well, like the notes are sort of this like lower dimensional latent space to the actual music that we hear. Um, is there a way to be, do these sorts of things, these sorts of projects where you're actually generating the notes or you're generating sketches um, without this sort of strongly supervised data of sketches and notes? I think like if if we don't have any sketch data, like all, all of the work here relies on there being a data set available. But if if we don't have any data set, then you know deep learning doesn't really work. We we need to have a lot of data for, for it to work. So uh, unless we have a model that has a good prior to draw how a human would draw, mm -hmm. then it, it should be quite difficult. Right. But like the output domain is I guess some sort of prior. You have to use a pen. Um, and so like humans, for example, they have this prior over like I need to draw with a pen and so I need to make this representation with a pen with a limited number of strokes exactly, that represents yeah. the same sort of thing that someone else would understand. It is. From, from a drawing, like there has been work you know, before deep learning existed on, on how people, for example, draw aesthetically. If, for example, like a, the curvature of a line should be within like a certain degree per, per <laughs> length, right? For example, so there's all of these like uh, constructs and one of the interesting things that, you know, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but for me is like, a, whether these heuristic could be learned from a human data. So, I mean, in, in our data set, it's certainly we don't label whether something looks good or not. But if, if for example, if we have, have a good idea on our data as to what looks good or not, we could potentially train a machine learning model to learn such a heuristic. But I, I think like, a, even if we don't have these heuristics, like uh, what, what is interesting is like if we could have like a, a constrained model that has very few parameters. Uh, for, for example, e even if, if, we, if we do train like a sketch RNN model on non-drawings, but on, on like generated SVG files on fonts, like for example, and, and we train an S a sketch RNN on artificial data, uh, we could potentially have a very small latent vector parameter that can fits a drawing so that your, your drawing of a cat would look like these, you know, like a Helvetica font mm -hmm. and so on. So, so like that, th these are, uh, opens up many possibilities. So I, I do like the idea on, on not relying on a lot of data, but like uh, it, in, in the current world, it does seem like you know, deep learning, one of the, one of the, the downsides of it, it, it does require a lot of data to train a model. And it's more like an art than a science to be able to pick on what pre-trained models you can use or whether there's a large data set. Like if, if you're starting a, like if you want to do a, like a, a company here and you want to train models but you don't have enough data, it's, it's more like an art than choose what data sets you should use that's available and train your model on that. And then right. you have your targeted data then you want to, which is probably like 50 of your buddies. <laughs> and then you want to train your models on those 50 samples. So I think you know, like there, there's things that we can work around without a lot of data. But currently, I think you know, unfortunately, we do need a, a lot of data because these are like stupid yeah. algorithms. I would just just want to add something real quick. Like I think that I think kind of what you're getting at maybe is like removing like bias of, of the structure that we would impose on it. And so like I think already the goal of at least the music side of things is is to get away from like earlier AI music, like David Cope and others is like is like taking little snippets of, of composed pieces and rearranging them essentially. So I, we're a little bit further away from that, right? But we are still, and by using MIDI, like we are limiting ourselves to these certain pitches and you know, that you can't actually make something in between those pitches. Um, and so I think, and also I would, we, you know, we're limiting ourselves to the data set that we found, which is going to be a lot of Western music. It's like a lot of video game music, a lot of pop music. Um, it's, it's definitely not everything. And so I think actually the, the right answer is, first of all, you need more data, like is, is, is will re reduce the bias, right? If you have more varied, a lot more data and a lot more varied data. And also if you can get, if you can remove any sort of um, like distillation of that data ahead of time, you want like the most raw version of it. 
which in the case of music would be like the audio. Mm -hmm. So I think InSynth was, was kind of getting at that. You know, that's like what we can do now is a single note just because it's very, um, modeling audio is, is just such a, such a dense piece, type of data that it's really hard to do with our current like technical limi limitations. But that'll be eventually surmounted and I think the answer is like feeding all of the audio of all of music from YouTube or whatever into a model and having it learn everything then you get the least biased version of, of, of that. Um, so I have two questions. One is related to, to Zane's, which is, what data set do you not have that you wish existed? <laughs> um, and I know, like, I was just talking to someone else on the NLP side where, you know, like you mentioned, there's sort of over-representations of certain data and mm -hmm. um, under-representations of others. So. Yeah, so I, I, I personally really want so first of all, if, if we could just access audio, then I'll, I would have all the data I wanted. And so we're kind of trying to crack that open. But um, if I could have like some really incredible um, Im improvisers performing on like MIDI instruments <laughs> for many, many hours uh, together, that would be what I want. Because I really want to model that interaction between different, um, different musicians performing in, like, in a, like in a live setting and do it in a way such that they're not able to be aware of what the others are thinking. So really modeling them independently so that they're listening to each other just like actual musicians, musicians are doing. Musicians, that's really hard to say. Um, and then, then you can take out, you know, then now you can play along with it, right? Like you can, now one of them's a human or three of them are humans or whatever. And then you have this like AI band, which was, I think would be pretty incredible. Mm, I, I think like one of the things when I started with the sketch project is uh, I found it's very difficult to get rated data. Like what data is looks good aesthetically? Because my my goal was to to judge not whether the machine can draw a cat or not, but whether it can draw good cats or not. So I think having access to data where you can have like a, a ratings between you know like a, to to rate the aesthetics would be useful. But however, this actually is a good question because it's actually very difficult to me because like what looks good today does not look good tomorrow. We get bored, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have some data that we can optimize for using these deep learning frameworks, we can generate something that looks good today, but tomorrow it will get boring. So that's an open question. And that, that ties in with you know, some of the thoughts I have on novelty and whether we can generate something that it's outside of the data distribution and there's a lot more going at it. But I don't think data is, personally my opinion is it's not data and algorithms is not the only way. We actually need better solutions and maybe you know we with more data we can improve our models but maybe we need better models um, cool and my second question kind of related to what you brought up at the end was um, I'm curious if there's any work you guys are doing on sort of expressing more abstract notions of style or aesthetics um, or if you've looked at data on you know Pinterest or Tumblr or Instagram where you know, like a lot of times people say this is a very Tumblr look because everything's <laughs> spray painted rose gold or something. Um, and I'm curious, like from a higher level, if you've looked at, you know, this is like a very Japanese, you know, minimalist aesthetic. Let's say. Well, I mean, I don't have access to Instagram or Tumblr data. <laughs> 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 or I, I guess I'm curious if anyone's just doing research on sort of like expressing aesthetics. That that is something that we're currently looking at. I think. Actually, recently is, there's a paper, I'm not sure whether it's out yet, but there are some work being done inside the Magenta group on, on you know, like modeling aesthetics. But at, as I said, like, there, there's just so much more to be done. Like, I don't, like, even if they're even possible to do it, like what looks good now is not going to look good tomorrow. Um, sort of maybe a follow on to that second question there was, um, have you done much with genres in particular mm. interpolation between two latent spaces? Yeah. So like a Beatles reggae, I love reggae covers of all the Beatles songs. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that a great, possible? that's a great question. It's definitely possible. Um, it's difficult because of, because of the lack of metadata essentially, like all the, the MIDI files that we scrape from the web, most of them, you know, they're all named differently. There's not like a clear identifier that this is a certain genre, this is a certain band. Um, so that's one issue. We have like several ways that we're exploring to get around that. But one thing you could could imagine doing, and and again, this is so this is all. There's a lot of low hanging fruit here that we just don't have time to get around to. But one one idea I have is, you know, you can just sample from this latent space and identify by listening, like, oh, that's this style um, of music. 
once you have those labels, the latent space should be laid out in such a way that similar styles are nearby in space in, in some way. And then once you have those labels, then you could you know, pick something out from this area and this, something out from this other area and, and then do the interpolation or even identify um, some direction in the latent space that is more reggae or less reggae. And, and so if we had labels ahead of time, if we knew for a fact, like if we, we were starting from audio, for example, and we could just take all the audio and YouTube and which we know the genres for a lot of it, um, then the problem would be pretty much solved. It's really the difficulty of, of getting that access to that information. Sorry if this is a bit of an obvious question, Adam, but I was just wondering if you had looked at um, using um, attentional models to deal with the long-term dependencies in the music generation, or maybe from the language modeling literature, like a, a cache pointer or something like that. Um, so I, I haven't personally, but we do have um, a brain resident on our, on our team, Anna Wong, who is working on uh, using like the, the transformer attention is all you need. Um, and it's actually, I think there's a lot of challenges. I don't actually know the details of, of what's happening. I know she's recently had some more success and I don't know what the particular challenges are, but it seems like there, it wasn't as easy as, as, she, as she'd originally hoped it would be <laughs> to get it to work. And I don't know if that's technical reasons or not, but um, I, I, I haven't looked at the other, um, at this point I haven't looked at anything outside of the LSTM based solution, which I, I, you know, is kind of old at this point, but it seems to work fairly well, um, uh, except for the fact that it's really slow to train. So trying these other types of ideas, I definitely, definitely have plans to do it, um, or hopefully finding other people to do it for me, <laughs> if possible. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's still a little um, confusing for me as I, as, you know, as, as you go through the talks, as to whether you feel like the when the, you know, even the medium term like goal of all the work that you're doing is really fundamental understanding of the nature of a creative, you know, fields, whether it be music or whether it be, you know, uh, 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 visual arts, kind of using the corpus of, you know, such data that we have, you know, from all time versus really like augmenting the ability of artists to be able to create, you know, more interesting work in the future. Um, and if it is if it is the the latter, which is really the augmentation, then I guess I'm a little confused as to why um, there aren't more like you know there's not more artist feedback loops, kind of like in you know kind of the solutions and not even the solutions, kind of like the models that you have generated, to be able to figure out like fundamentally is it is it enabling these artists to create you know what they what they kind of like you know determine as creativity. If the question makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, like, so we, we do have, so I didn't, I didn't mention anything here, but we do have several, art, well, many artist collaborations actually going on. Um, it's a very slow feedback loop for one thing, and I think right now the main challenge, and it's, it's on us, is like making these things easy enough for them to use with the tools that they're used to use, like they're used to using, right? We have, we've, we've made some simple web apps in the past, or we've had you know, Creative Lab, other teams at Google have made them for us. But they're always either, um, they're, they're too simple, they don't allow for the control that, that I'm talking about, and they don't allow for a musician to, to easily um, work within you know, their, their normal workflow and, and kind of just add this new thing inside of it. Um, so it's hard to get them to use it is the main, is the main answer. Like people are, they're always, we have artists come to us all the time like, oh I wanna, this stuff sounds amazing, I wanna play with it. It's like, okay here, install this you know, pip package and <laughs> They have no idea what we're talking about, and so it's. I think it's more of this gap between, between um, where we are in terms of our um, infrastructure and in terms of what TensorFlow is able to do, and and that's quickly. Um, we're we're quickly bri bridging that gap, but I think we're not at the point where we can do that full study. Um, so this is we've had to kind of rely on ourselves as a test bed, but in the very near term, I think we'll be at a point where we can get a lot more feedback. I, th I think that's a really good question. Like a. Uh, the problem, I think we've, we've discussed this many times, is there's too many knobs <laughs> in the machine learning algorithms. Like, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, if you want to generate some sounds or some sketches, you don't want to control like you know, F16 pilots you know, with hundreds of buttons. But at the same time, you don't want to constrain the artist to have a dumb interface that has two dimensions, right? right. And, and also, I think personally it's important because you know, art, artists are getting more technical as well. Like when I visited New York, there's, there's artists that use like P5.js. Like they, they're good at implementing things uh, using, using like a, a language. They may, not be, like they may not be interested to 
to study C++ or to, to learn the latest framework, but they can program. So I think it's also it's important for them to, to be able to take things and extend it. So I think it's important to create a middle ground so that something that's generic enough that like, the modern artist can take and, and extend. And, and we're not going to get anywhere until we, it's not going to be a loop, but more like a diffusion mm. of, of the artists going into our field. Uh, the, the good thing about, like uh, you mentioned uh, visual arts as well, I think visual arts has the advantage of it being easier. Like, like, like any, anyone that doesn't know how, if you don't know how to program, you, you can train a GAN on some data set and it will generate some pixels. Whether it makes sense or not, it doesn't matter. But at least people can take it and do something with it. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing more of that and hopefully in, in the music space, we're going to see more of that as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because yeah, I think in, in terms of visual art, it's not necessarily our things, but like there's been a lot of work adopted by, by really incredible like cutting edge artists we're doing some really cool stuff with GANs and, and um, other latent space models. But uh, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I have an example. So okay. like, for example, like there, there's this group I know that they, they took a GAN and they, they trained it on, on fashion, on, on random data sets of clothing uh, using an off-the-shelf DC GAN. And then they trained it on, on a set of a thousand different you know, Uniqlo or you know, Gap wear. And then they, they moved around the latent space to generate clothing that they thought looked funky. So it could be an artifact of the model being bad, but we don't know. But what they ended up doing was they, they actually took these samples and manufactured them. And then they, they actually look you know, kind of funky. And, and maybe because machine learning is interesting, it's gimmicky, or maybe it does look good. And, but the important thing is it looks interesting. And, and actually, that, that's actually going to be, be uh, featured as a spotlight at the NIPS workshop for creativity. He's like, I'm going to plug for myself next week. So uh, like we, uh, there's a lot of people who are maybe not experts at machine learning, but they're taking, they're using GitHub. They're these undergrad students. They're, they're playing around with data sets. They're doing things that are not technically correct. Like they don't care about overfitting on a, on a training set. Like none of it matters, but they're, they're outputting stuff and maybe it looks interesting. And I think that's important. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I tried during his, his talking to find the artist I was thinking of, but I couldn't. But there's like Mike Taika, who, who works on the Cerebra, Cerebra team at Google Brain, who's taken like, you know, if you look, think about Deep Dream, people were like, oh, this, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Deep Dream probably. Yeah. So it was like, people were like, oh, this is like neural network art. And then we quickly, everybody quickly realized like, oh, this is, it does the same thing every time. It's kind of boring. But he actually took it and like, has made these really incredible art pieces by, um, you know, by making, by making it his own style and like really adjusting things and, and getting into the, the innards of, of the network itself. Um, and, and there's other people who have done that. And again, I'm blanking on their names, but I can, I can send you guys an email later with a few, few good examples. Yeah, so I had a question a little bit different from these. Just have you thought about, or are you doing any applications with health? So when you have um, like music, I, I don't know enough about visual art, but music can have an impact on the psyche in a very distinct way. It can also affect sleep. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, you can listen to a, a sleep tape and insomnia affects 50 million Americans or some form of it. So there are ways in which you can use a feedback loop between, let's say, a musical system yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, so, so there's a, we have an intern on our team, Natasha Jakes, who, that's basically her thesis project, is taking sensors on, you know, watches or whatever, like the monitor heart rate and other things, and, and then trying to generate music to balance out, you know, to reduce the heart rate or you know, affect their, their mood in different ways. Um, we're not, she's not actually doing that as, as a project on brain, but that's, uh, like, that work is definitely being explored. Being <laughs> so I'm curious about where you guys go from here. How do you, and how do you make that decision? And how does Google, you know, decide where to deploy its resources? It's, it's that's really a great, great question. I wish I knew the yeah. answer to that question. I, I, I mean, <laughs> like, speaking from experience, like this, I mean, it's not, I don't think this is really how things work, but inside Google Brain is like, it's a pretty good environment and people can work on whatever they're interested in. So I'm, I mean, maybe because Google is like a, quite a well-funded company and, yeah. you know. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, I mean, they're paying me to generate cats. It's almost yeah. like a, everybody in Google Brain is like a tenured profession, professor or something. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Dwight has the last question. Oh. Joseph, no on. pressure. Um, so I, I feel like images have rather famously had um, uh, content versus style separated. And, and we've been able to say this is, 
you know, the style of Picasso and there's a cat. Um, I wouldn't necessarily know how to do it with uh, music besides, you know, a similar gram matrices of the convolutions. Have you worked on it? And is there a way to you know, reinterpret the same tune with different styles? Yeah, uh, there, I think that was like one of the first things we tried, although it was, I think Sinjin Resnick, Sinjin Resnick, who I think was at South Park Commons at some point, um, tried this. And it's just, it's just, it's working with audio is really, like you need to do it in the audio space. And, uh, and working with audio is just really challenging. And I, this, is, this is pre WaveNet as well. So I, we, we just like, it just failed miserably pretty much. I think it is possible. I don't know exactly what it, how it would, you know, what it would sound like if, if grand matrices are the right form to, to, to model the style in or not. Um, but I don't think anybody successfully. Well, what, really one of your it. examples near the end was you used the, the GAN to move the nearest latent space so that it played. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah. I, by, but uh, yeah, so I think if you maybe if you tr if you trained like an audio model in, in, with a latent variable, you might be able to make it happen. But uh, yeah, I think we're still kind of far from from the technical ability to do that with you know GPUs and TPUs getting bigger maybe one day. Okay. Yeah.